I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you on uh, some of the work we've been doing on um, disaster response and the role in uh, managing our animal populations and pets with it. Uh, as you may have seen, we have our trailer parked outside. Unfortunately, it's not a very nice day to look at it. Uh, there is a fact sheet on it out on the table out here. There is also a pet owner's guide to disaster preparedness, which you may find uh, informative. Uh, so some resources there for you, something to look at. Uh, so the Board of Animal Health, um, our charge, which we take very seriously, is prevention, detection, control, eradication of infectious, contagious, and communicable diseases affecting the health of animals and processing and distribution of products derived from animals to control health hazards that may threaten public health. And of course the second part of that I'll be speaking on this afternoon in the uh, food safety section on our dairy and meat inspection programs. Uh, we have four primary mission areas. Uh, animal health which includes disease control, that'd be things like tuberculosis, brucellosis, um, oh, uh, EHD in, in cattle and deer. In fact, yesterday before I came here, I was doing an investigation on uh, what's probably EHD in cattle in, in uh, Ripley County. Um, disaster preparedness, readiness for major events, uh, natural disasters or uh, uh, man-made ones. Food safety, again, our, our meat, poultry, and dairy inspection programs. And then animal care, which has become a much more important area than in the past, working on standards of care for livestock uh, and also pets. And again, to give you an example of what we do with there, a couple weeks ago I was down in Switzerland County and we had a, a hoarder with 90 dogs. And so part of our job was to go down there and uh, assess the condition of those animals um, and to help the, the county uh, seize those animals from, from this owner. So disaster response, I mean, just like the rest of us, uh, we integrate in with the, the rest of the state and county and federal programs. Uh, we follow the Department of Homeland Security order of operations. We respond when requested. Um, our field districts, and I believe there's a map on here later of our districts. There we go. These districts match the public health and the uh, Homeland Security districts. Uh, I have District 9 down in the southeast corner, 12 county area there, and interact uh, regularly with the public health people and emergency uh, management people in that area. Um, each of the veterinarians that has an area um, has response for that geographic area, and then they also have an area of specialization. Uh, my areas are tuberculosis and brucellosis. Um, uh, e again, each of the field veterinarians, such as myself, we have regular contact with the uh, Department of Homeland Security district representatives, uh, and we're all ICS trained up to level 400, and that allows us to interact again on that uh, in that ICS system. So there's the map again. Now, uh, the only thing I will say, in back down in the uh, southeast corner, Dr. Bartlett, uh, Tim Bartlett, is unfortunately on. Uh, long-term disability, so his area is being covered by the two adjacent veterinarians, Dr. Lovejoy and uh, Dr. Combs. So Indiana was the first state to include disaster planning for animals. In 1995, we had the SAVE program, a state annex for veterinary emergencies, which kind of got us to thinking of um, how does disaster preparedness and response, um, how do we include animals in that, that and veterinarians in that program. Uh, later this became ACERT, which is our current uh, program, which is Animal Surveillance and Emergency uh, Response Teams. And basically each district has an ACERT team that's made up of private veterinarians and vet technicians. And they have been ICS trained up to, I believe, 300. And they've had some foreign animal disease uh, training. And their role basically, if we have a, a true disaster, is uh, they would be a backup for us because there just aren't enough regulatory veterinarians to, to cover if we had a true, uh, say, a foreign animal disease outbreak or an animal-related disaster. And so these people have enough training that they can come in and back us up and, and assist us in, in the response. Um, and there's again, there's one team in each district. I have one in District 9. 
we do some training. We try to meet with them somewhat regularly. Uh, of course, funding is always an issue, as it is with all of us. Uh, in a disaster response, the Board of Animal Health mans the ESF 11 seat in the EOC. That's the Agriculture and Natural Resources Annex. Um, to give you an example, during the, the tornadoes down in, in Henryville and Marisville, uh, we were helping to man that seat. Dr. Sandy Norman uh, and Mr. Doug Metcalf out of our office spent a, quite a bit of time down at the EOC in Indianapolis. Uh, that's shared with the State Department of Agriculture. Um, tasks and needs are submitted to this seat and then passed on to the appropriate agency. Um, this, uh, the idea is that we provide resources to our local agencies for response. Uh, we also have a pretty neat database, USA Herds, that allows us to look at um, the premises in the state. Uh, this database has uh, each, each uh, livestock operation is to have a premise ID number and uh, you can go into the database, drill down from that number and find out what type of animals they have, what are the contacts, the numbers of animals, a uh, uh, certain amount of information. If we have a disease investigation, that's also found in this database. Uh, provides for rapid traceability. Uh, it's updated fairly regularly. Um, there is limited access and the reason they put this is that when this database was, was being put together, there were some privacy concerns. Um, you know, obviously not all the livestock producers want all their information in this database. So uh, there is access. We have total access to it, and then there's some limited access by USDA and some other organizations. Um, disease incidents are recorded and stored in this database, whether it be a TB investigation, a foreign animal disease investigation, or even a, uh, an animal neglect investigation. Uh, we also have a class called Animal Issues and Disasters. It's a one-day class. It's led by us. Um, it gives an overview of animal-related emergencies. Uh, attendees can be anyone from uh, uh, first responders, veterinarians. Uh, the one I attended, I sat next to uh, a lab animal veterinarian from the School of Medicine in Indianapolis. Um, it gives the community an outline. The idea is to get the people together to work to try and put some type of response outline together uh, that they can put into their emergency response plans. And there's also CE credit available. Uh, if someone was interested in hosting one of these, um, you know, if they get hold of me and we could see about um, um, you know, where to have it, uh, I think they're, you know, they usually like to have, I believe, about 15, 20 people attend it. That is something that can be put together. Um, you know, each community, you're talking about vulnerability assessments, we just did one in Ripley County, and uh, each community is susceptible to different man-made natural disasters, and of course this plan must take into account the probability of all these events occurring, uh, and then the different resources that are available, such as uh, sheltering for animals, uh, you know, the numbers, sizes, first responders. Um, and I think, you know, in the past one of the problems has been people don't take, when they're doing this planning, they don't take into account uh, the livestock and the animals in the area. Uh, you know, in, Indiana is a very strong agricultural state and livestock and agriculture in general plays a huge role in the economy. Um, I know Ripley County, you know, we're, we're mostly rural, mostly farms, so uh, if you don't take that into account, you've, you've uh, left out a large part of the uh, uh, of the county. Uh, also pets, you know, the fact that people don't like to leave their pets behind when there is a disaster and that they need to plan to, for what to do with them as well. Um, and we like to talk about creating a family plan. You know, everybody's supposed to have a go kit. If there's an emergency, you grab your kit, you're ready to go. Well, this in needs to include a, uh, <coughs> pardon me, a go kit for your pet. Um, you know, it, you should have leash or crate, depending on the animal, you know, extra food, dish, toys, medicines. A copy of the veterinary records is nice, too, especially if there's any question about immunization, um, you know, because state law does require cats, dogs, and ferrets to have rabies vaccines. Uh, and then store in the location near an exit in the home, uh, just like your own kit that we're all supposed to have. Oh, and, and on this, too, um, you know, we think about pets, but then you also have to think, what if you have livestock? What if you have horses? What would you do with them? Do you have enough food on hand? Do you have someone to help you care for them? Do you have a trailer where you can take them elsewhere if you need to? 
So it's all good things to think about in case of a disaster. Ah, and there's our trailer, Indiana's Animal Disaster Response Unit. Again, it's sitting out in the parking lot back here. It's a fully stocked mobile disaster response unit for companion animals. Uh, it fulfills uh, the Pets Act from 2006, Public Law 109-308, uh, which sets aside money to assist states in disaster preparedness for companion and service animals. It's put together as a response, I believe, to uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, and the people that would not leave without their pets. Uh, it's created to provide assistance to Indiana citizens, their pets, their owners in times of emergencies. Also to educate the public about disaster preparedness and, and that's why we like to bring it to things like this meeting, county fairs, uh, what have you, you know, set it up, let people look at it, see what kind of capabilities we have for this. And of course can be used free of charge by any uh, agency that requests it. Uh, and again, you know, I think it's been proven over and over every time there is a disaster of some type that animal owners would rather stay behind than leave their pets. You know, our pets become part of our family and to leave them behind is kind of unthinkable. Um, Red Cross does not allow pets into human shelters. Again, that was de demonstrated during Hurricane Katrina and the flooding afterwards. Um, so, you know, some of the ideas are to establish pet housing near human shelters. Of course, that will encourage people to get out of the danger zone and to evacuate to these safe areas. And the fact that we really would like animal owners to have disaster kits ready for each pet. I know very few of us do, but or at least to think about what would they do if they had to leave, you know, with just a few minutes notice, what do you do with your animals? Can they travel with you or do you have somewhere alternative that you can take them? So what is the pet's trailer? We have a couple pictures here of it open uh, and closed. Uh, and it shows all the uh, gear stored in the back of it there and then what it looks like from, from the rear. Uh, the trailer is available for use by any Indian organization or government agency. Again, it could be used for training, to be used for exercises, education, uh, and of course for disaster response. Uh, during the, the tornadoes in, in our area, um, there was some preliminary uh, request. Uh, it actually wasn't uh, sent down to the area, but there was some questions about possibly using it down in Floyd County. Um, and of course, those responses, just like any response for, for aid, need to go through the proper channels, which would be the, um, the, uh, the county EOC and then up the chain to, uh, to the EOC in Indianapolis and then to our agency. The trailer can be used as a backdrop or a prop promoting animal preparedness. Uh, there's a, I don't have a copy on me, but there's a little uh, pamphlet that tells about the trailer, its capabilities, what you need to haul it and such. And I believe it even has a little outline in it of how to set things up so people can look. We, we don't actually want people to go in the trailer, but you can set things up around it and you know have the doors open so people can look inside of it and see what's there. Um, good events for the trailer to be seen, again, things like county fairs, safety days, uh, festivals, anything that includes pets, health fairs, meetings like this, you know, our public health meetings, uh, veterinary meetings, uh, I believe, you know, at the state fair, it was up there, places like that. And it can be opened up to display the contents on the inside. We ask that it not be emptied at events. Uh, and of course, you don't want people rooting around in there. Um, there is a, a, like I said, there's a, an outline, there's a graph inside the, the pamphlet that comes with it that shows how you can set things up. Um, and of course, as always, actual emergencies would take precedent in the trailer schedule. So uh, if something was to come up where someone actually needed it to use in disaster response, that would take precedent. Uh, it has supplies to accommodate up to 75 companion animals. There's cages, crates, collars, leashes, basic medical supplies. There's ID microchip readers, um, feeding supplies. There's a generator in there. Doesn't include perishables like food, drugs, vaccines, medical equipment, computers, 
pruners, and of course the staff does not come with the trailer. Uh, the idea is that whoever's borrowing it will provide um, a place to put these crates and, and um, cages and such, that they'll have a, a potable water supply that can be used, uh, that there's electrical and heating, cooling sources, but though again there is a generator in the trailer, uh, and then staffing. Um, I, you know, I think normally the thought would be uh, veterinarians, private veterinarians, veterinary technicians, um, shelter employees, humane society, animal control personnel, those type of people. Uh, and to transport it, the requesting organization must move the trailer to and from the event. Now, I, my, for instance, my vehicle that I have from the state is a uh, Dodge Caravan, which will not pull it. Um, you need to have either a fairly heavy-duty SUV or a full-size truck, I believe. Uh, I've been told it pulls pretty heavy. It's a heavy trailer, so better to have too big a vehicle than too small. <clears throat> the vehicle should be able to tow about two and a half tons. Uh, you don't have to have a CDL to use it, just a valid driver's license. Um, the trailer is located on the Indiana State Fairgrounds, which is convenient for us because that's where our office is now. And they do, con they do recommend a brake control package. It doesn't have to have one on the vehicle it used to haul it, but again, I've heard it's much easier if it has one. So requesting the trailer is fairly simple, actually. Uh, the, again, if there's an actual disaster, and this is part of the response to it, we ask that you use the chain of command, use the ICS system that we've all learned, uh, that the organization go through the county EMA, and then that will come up to the state and go to our organization. Uh, and then there'll be an MOU signed if there isn't already one, and then the trailer will be released for use. Uh, and then, of course, the requesting organization returns the trailer to us. Now, in this case, where it's for an event like this, you can just call the office and talk to Mr. Mark Stillman. Uh, is usually who I recommend people talk to. He's kind of our IT slash vehicle person and, and maintains the trailer and, and knows the specifics of it. Yeah, it says the request process is the same for disaster situations, promotional events. Um, no, not really. I mean, like I said, with a, with a disaster, you want to follow the chain of command, you want to go through the EOC, you want to make it an official request. Whereas for an event like this, it's fairly informal. Uh, the main thing is that we know where the trailer is in case there's a, a true need for it. And obviously it should be requested as early as possible to avoid scheduling issues and to make sure we have a way to get it to you, either that you pick it up or I think we have within our vehicles a couple of vehicles that can, that can pull it if need be. And then, you know, people want to know how can they help. Everybody wants to help the dogs and cats and the pets. You know, everybody loves their pets. And so donations can be used uh, to help support this trailer. Uh, they can be done through the, the IVMA, the Indiana Veterinary Medical Association. Um, they designate the, the gift basically as the BOA Pets trailer. And then the funds are used to pr promote preparedness. They're used to restock supplies on the trailer, uh, extend the capacity of the trailer. Um, you know, any, any repairs, whatever, that would need to be made to it to, to help with that. And, and really, that's, that's it as far as the, the trailer. I, if you get a chance, I would take a look at it. I don't think it's open right now. Um, of course, it is raining. Last time I was out there, it was kind of nasty. Uh, but you know, if you wanted to at least look in the door, see what it looks like, but also just get an idea how large it is and what's what's uh, what's required to to haul it around. Because like I said, it's not a little trailer, and a bigger vehicle is better if you're planning to to borrow it. Um, are there any questions? It doesn't have to be just on the trailer, but on emergency preparedness or our role in this. Yes, ma'am. Oh, as far as a time frame? No, it's, it's whatever you need it for. For instance, uh, I believe somebody came up and got it Friday to bring it here, and they'll take it back. I don't, I'm not sure who's driving it. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Yeah, so it depends, however long you need it. I don't think there's a, a limit on the time. Depends on the length of the meeting or the event that it's being shown at. Again, unless a true emergency was to come up. Um, I also know, as an aside, that... Um, 
For instance, the Ripley County uh, EMA uh, director is, has put this into his emergency plans that this is a resource he can call upon if needed. And it actually did, it, the, the request never was formally put in. Someone, uh, I think it was the uh, Floyd, Floyd County Animal Shelter director called me that weekend and I told him, you have to request it through the county EOC. It has to go through uh, the chain of command and I don't think they ever actually needed it. They, um, at least in Floyd County, they did a pretty good job of, of finding uh, sheltering for animals that needed it. Now, after the, uh, after the tornadoes, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, myself and a couple of the veterinarians from our office actually went to the affected counties and talked to the animal shelters and veterinarians to see what other things they might need. And honestly, the biggest thing we heard was they needed more cages. Uh, the farmers needed fencing material. Uh, there was plenty of food. There was even hay being brought in from out of state and things like that. So we tried to kind of follow up to see, well, what, what weren't we meeting? And uh, most of it was uh, basically ways to contain the animals. Yes, sir. The, the what? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'd stay as far away as possible. <laughs> <coughs> well, theoretically, the state veterinarian has um, jurisdiction, I guess you'd say, over all animals in the state. Uh, probably not wildlife, because that would be DNR, that would be Department of Natural Resources area. Um, what, now, what I heard in Ohio they're trying to do is set up some kind of central, uh, they're going to build a facility near Reynoldsburg where they can bring these animals, because they figure once the laws are in place, they're going to have all kinds of animals seized. Um, we don't usually get involved with exotics too much. Um, you know, we have a program that covers farmed cervids, elk, deer, that type of thing. We do quite a bit with them. Of course, if you look at our regulations, those are considered livestock. Um, occasionally, we'll get involved with something like when we had, I don't know if you, back when I first started this position, my first job was monkeypox. We had monkeypox, and so we had to go around and look at naked Gambian rats and all these nasty little animals which was very unusual for us. So we can get involved in that. And right now we're doing some work with LCMV in uh, mice that's gone to pet stores. But again, that's kind of a, uh, that's something new for us. We don't normally get involved much with exotics. Uh, my guess would be if there was a problem like that, we would be involved to some extent. Probably uh, the conservation officers, uh, DNR would be involved. You've also got USDA animal care. And they, they specifically do things like inspect zoos and uh, research facilities. I would think they would be heavily involved in it. Um, and then I, I tell you, a lot of times if it's an exotic, I, I consult with uh, zoo veterinarians as far as you know, specific questions, how to handle uh, disease issues and such, because of course they're the ones that deal with it every day. But yeah, that, that's kind of a scary thought to think we'd have to work with those kind of animals. I, I just, uh, you know, a, a big angry 2,000-pound uh, cow's bad enough. If you look at the animal welfare, the livestock welfare regulations, they're pretty broad, and that is under our uh, prevalence. If you look, Board of Animal Health is supposed to be the agency that deals with that in this state, and we're, we're to be the subject matter experts, basically. And I believe if you look at how it's worded, um, it doesn't give specific as to the size of a pen or uh, you know how many animals per pen or cage or whatever, as much as that it has to, I'm trying to think of how they worded it, because it's a very short document. Um, it has to meet like basically the welfare needs of the animal and not be cruel or inhumane. But it doesn't give specifics as far as, uh, say, farrowing crates, those type of things. There, aren't, there isn't anything specific in the state. 
Um, I think you will see, as with these restaurants that are responding to pressure they're getting, uh, you're going to see some market-driven changes. Uh, you know, if, if, if uh, obviously if Wendy's only buys ham, uh, bacon from sows that don't have farrowing crates, then you're going to get more people going that way because they want that those sales in that market. But as far as us, we don't have anything specific. We had, when they were looking at that, they thought about, well, do we want to look at specific sizes and such? And it was thought rather than that to leave it somewhat open so we can adapt as more information becomes available and as basically the, the climate and the situation changes. But it is, I mean, it is something we deal with, don't get me wrong. And we do neglect investigations. You know, we do, most of the ones that I've done historically have been horses, but I've done cattle, I've done swine, I've done dogs. Um, you know, I've gone to some places where it's just a menagerie. Uh, but, but in those cases, you're dealing with an actual neglect, you know, an abuse of the animal where the animal hasn't been, been fed or, or a lot of times there's problems with the owner. There's some other issues there that are, that are causing it. Um, to a certain extent, it is the call uh, of the agency and basically the the experts, the people that deal with with um, you know livestock agriculture and who know the animals, you know veterinarians, animal behaviorists, that type of thing. Yeah, it is. You're welcome. Any other questions? I think that's it. Thank you.